Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. And a high compliments to the SICON organizers for putting together yet another excellent conference, the 15th. And a warm welcome to our four expert panelists in order, Greg Falco, Tara Brown, Johnny Ace, and Peter Marguez. We want to just make sure Peter's with us. Uh, he's video conferencing in. So Peter, are you here? There we go. Hi, Peter. Hi. There we go. Hi, welcome as well. <laughs> uh, so a quick intro to our topic, then I'll present the bios of our four panelists as they each their, share their insights. Each one will have 15 minutes for presenting, and we've planned to have leave time at the end for audience Q&A, so please do note down your questions and your comments, with an emphasis on questions, please. So with your permission, I'd like to start us off by adding one more word to this session's title, and that word is cybersecurity. It's important to add it. I'm sorry, excuse me, I didn't introduce myself. Deborah Housen Coriel. Um, all necessary details are in the conference materials, and these experts are the main, main focus, so um, we can skip over my intro. So the word cybersecurity added to our title. It's important to add this word because cybersecurity is, in fact, the connector between new space and armed conflict. So with that addition, uh, we're now looking at the topic of new space, cybersecurity, and armed conflict. And let's start off with a quotation from an article published by space security specialist, Jana Robinson, way back in 2016, which is all the more relevant today. She wrote, as the space and cyberspace domains are linked as operationally, space cannot exist without cyber, and cyber in some cases without space. And they permeate all other warfighting domains together, i.e. land, air, and sea. Cyber-related vulnerabilities of space assets are a major concern. Global effects, and I'm adding a phrase, of a breach of these vulnerabilities would be virtually instantaneous on Earth and elsewhere. So with that critical nexus between cybersecurity and outer space in mind, I'd like to set the stage by posing three different questions that are actually, we're actually going to address in this session. First, what's new space? Second, why is it relevant to cybersecurity experts? And finally, what's the importance of new space to military experts, cyber and otherwise? Since Gregory, Tara, Johnny, and Peter will be addressing the last two questions in their detailed remarks, I'll supply a few characteristics of new space just to start us off. So first of all, as many in this room already know, the term new space describes a technological, economic, and legal phenomenon. That's fairly new. Technological innovation in outer space is developing at an unprecedented pace on the part of both the traditional nation state and military actors, but also startups, SMEs, and large scale system integrators in space and on Earth. One example of this growth is the, number of, the sheer number of satellites that have been launched in the present decade in the 2020s, which will be four times higher than the number launched in the previous decade in the 210s. In 200, 2022 alone, 180 satellite launches took place, itself an annual record, adding to the nearly 6,000 satellites in orbit. So this dramatic increase in space activities overall, which as we're hit, we'll hear shortly encompasses a lot more than satellite launches, is the basis for the new space economy. New space is worth presently about 350 billion US dollars, and by 2040, we're looking at a trillion dollars. Those are gross estimates, but that's what we're looking at. This is, of course, the transparent commercial new space market. The military new space numbers are much more difficult to assess and, and in fact, to get to. So in addition to these technological and economic aspects of new space, new space is also driving dramatic changes in the legal and regulatory frameworks that exist in space, and in cyberspace, for that matter. So legally speaking, outer space was originally exclusively a nation state game. The five space treaties that were signed beginning 50 years ago, in particular the Outer Space Treaty, to which 115 states are currently party, determined that countries bear international responsibility for outer space activities, and there was no real conception of how private sector actors would uh, actually 
carry out activities in outer space other than strictly under their nation state's responsibility and guidance. But the nature of outer space actors is now changing extremely quickly, as we know, with the massive influx of private companies into all aspects of new space. And because of this change, there's also an inherent legal and regulatory tension in new space that we're going to explore today. Since the original nation state legal paradigm and the current pri private sector entry into that paradigm uh, is a little bit confusing, the tension has not yet been resolved. One example is the debate about whether commercial rights for the use of space resources by private actors may be acquired in the sense that they can be acquired commercially here on Earth. What about the whole issue of hostile cyber activity undertaken in outer space by private actors? How do we legally analyze that and to whom do we attribute similarly as to the same questions on Earth? These issues are relevant, of course, to innovations in the military uses of space and to the development of counter space weapons. And since that's where things get really interesting, I'm going to wrap up and turn over to our first speaker. Uh, so Greg Falco, you're first up. Let's hear a little bit about Greg. Yeah, you can come on over as you come over. Greg is an assistant professor at Cornell University's Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and in the Systems Engineering program. He's an aerospace security expert who designs and develops next-gen defense capabilities. He's also the director of the Aerospace Adversary Lab and the founding chair of the IEEE International Technical Standard for Space System Cybersecurity, which I'd love to hear about too. A Fulbright Scholar, he's received DARPA's Young Faculty Award and has been listed in Forbes 30 Under 30. Greg received his PhD at MIT. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks everyone for having me. So today I'm going to speak to you about next generation space technologies in research and development. Um, and specifically try and take the black hat perspective of why we need to worry about the future of what's coming out of the R&D landscape from a space technology standpoint. The reason why I wanted to start with this topic uh, and I wanted to kind of share this information with you is because it, not because it's impacting your lives today, but in the next 10 to 15 years, everything I describe to you right now in some semblance is going to be up there in space. And we need to be proactively thinking about the cyber policy and the standards and the requirements that are going to go into that kit that's going to be up in space in 15 years from now. Because if we're not doing that today, then we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice. So let me see, where is my clicker? So just to give you a slightly more background on, on our, our lab, uh, we are a lab in an aerospace and mechanical engineering department. Uh, so most of my students are aerospace folks, but we have computer science backgrounds. And so this kind of creates a really important nexus of skills and capabilities. Um, our work is pretty much exclusively funded by defense complex in the US. So we have a lot of projects right now with DARPA, um, as well as the US Space Force, Air Force Research Labs, a little bit with NASA, but they don't care as much about like 50 years stuff out because they want to wait 50 years to actually build anything. Um, and uh, we have a pretty robust group of students working on this with, with a team of doctoral students, master's students, and undergrads. It's a multidisciplinary group, which is also important to note. We have a bunch of computer scientists. We have a bunch of aerospace engineers. We have a bunch of political scientists, legal scholars, uh, as well as security studies analysts who are part of our research group. And some of them are doing open, open source reconnaissance um, on different activities that are happening in other nation states, and then trying to pull that into context of what capabilities do we actively need to be building out for the next 20 years, while others are deep in the weeds building code for us. So just wanted to share this because this, the types of topics that we're going to be talking about, and I'm going to share with you more insight on for what's coming down the pipe, they're not all informed by just, oh, I can put a, lot of, a bunch of code together or I can put together this launch kit and send it into space. It's informed by geopolitical context and what we think is needed for the future. So let me start with this. Uh, the first project I want to talk to you about is something called the Space Iron Dome. This is a program that's funded out of the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University. Um, it is, John, uh, APL is a UARC, which basically means it's exclusively funded by defense, uh, specifically the Navy, um, and this program is also funded by the U.S. Space Force. Uh, as you may all know, the Iron Dome um, is based in Israel, it is used for kinetic defense capabilities against missiles. And so what came to our heads was, in the future, we're going to need this capability for space vehicles. Not necessarily from a kinetic standpoint, 
because we don't want to have Kessler syndrome and have things blowing up all over the place and then doing, having kinetic conflict out in space. However, we need it from a digital standpoint, from an RF standpoint, uh, and from a cyber standpoint. So how do we begin to take some of this embodiment of this very effective uh, kinetic defense system that we have, and how do we take that and pop it into a tiny little space vehicle that has low swap constraints, low size, weight, and power constraints, um, and also is not really generally supposed to be equipped for war fighting or defense capabilities. So the project started with us taking an example uh, open source kit of what is for flight, available for flight software, and we tried to see what this thing can do uh, from a, a analysis standpoint. The fact is, most space vehicles from a flight software standpoint can't really do anything from a detection capability. It has something called a watchdog on it, which basically means it can tell you when things might break, and that's basically it. So we're dealing with very, very limited intrusion detection capabilities for these systems. And so what we ended up trying to figure out how to do uh, and what we're building currently is a reinforcement learning model-based approach to being able to engage an adversary once we note that there is anomalous activity on the space vehicle. Specifically, we're talking about active defense capabilities. So for a long time, this was something that was a no-no to talk about in public light, but it is important, and the US posture is at least right now, it's important to defend forward in the cyber domain. Right? We need to be able to meet our adversaries where they're at rather than letting them come on our turf. And therefore, what we wanted to do is embody this principle. And as we detect that there is noise or interference in our RF bands, because we're starting in the RF and then we're going to be moving into cyber, uh, we're, we've developed a mechanism to be able to play red team, blue team with an AI model that we then instill as an agent on the space vehicle. And that space vehicle, that agent, is then learning from this ground-based model, which is very intent computing intensive, and being able to pick up signals on the vehicle's edge, which is, again, very swap constrained, to be able to engage directly with an adversary when there is capabilities that are noted as anomalous. And so what are these active defense capabilities we're talking about? Well, first, we're trying to evaluate when we understand if there is interference events. Is it, is it adversarial? Is it jamming? Is it replay attacks? Is it... Um, is it spoofing events? And then we want to then parrot that activity right back to the adversary. And so using these AI models on the edge, we're able to effectively demonstrate right now on a flat sat environment uh, that we would be able to spit back whatever is being fired at us. And this is important to note because, not because we're gonna have this capability on the bird tomorrow, but because we are putting machine learning models on the edge, these very intense models that are trained on the ground but have actuation potential on the edge of the space vehicle. And because of that, we know that our adversaries are doing that as well. So for every action that we're taking from a defensive standpoint and being able to dem demonstrate defending forward, we know that someone is doing on the offensive standpoint too. Next one I'll talk to you about. This is called Orbits. Orbits is a program funded by DARPA. Uh, it's going to be... Uh, much bigger program than your future called something else because this was just a small uh, kind of play grant that I got that then developed into now a tens of millions of dollars program from DARPA. Um, and this is about trying to develop the future of the space internet for service exchange. Infrastructure as a service is going to be a big deal in space. We need to be able to uh, exchange capabilities with our partners and also our adversaries. And in order to do that, we need to facilitate this using a space internet, which is currently in the works. It's called Space Bacon. Uh, it's a space-based aperture uh, network terminal. And these assets are uh, engaged to normalize protocols of different space vehicles to communicate. But that's not what we're building here. What we're building here is a smart contract mechanism to make sure that we have zero trust that's required when you do exchange services. What does a service exchange even mean in space? Well, what I mean by it uh, is we are thinking about uh, if you have an arm, a robotic arm, and you need to do an OSAM, ISAM activity, right, in space servicing assembly manufacturing service, how do you get access to that if it's not on your bird? Well, you can't right now, right? So what we would want to be able to do is send a request out to the space internet that's out there uh, with very specific service parameters. And as part of those service parameters, we would want to make sure that we are establishing 
what those SLAs look like and that the person who is going to fulfill that service can prove that they'll meet those SLAs before that service is delivered. So if you have this ARM capability and you are expecting someone to come up to you, right, having a, a vehicle, another space vehicle come up to your space vehicle, you kind of have to trust that vehicle a little bit, right? Because they're going to dock to you or they are going to plug in to you. This is a very concerning matter that we're going to end up with in the next decade, which we already actually had proof of concepts on. So how do we make sure that that vehicle's actually not going to do something bad to you? Which is where we have this distributed ledger-based a smart contract me mechanism, which would help to define actors in good standing and actors in bad standing. And, enable to, and enabling this is going to have to be all of this edge computing capacity that we are going to be expecting to be coming online in the future. Because as you may well know, smart contracts do require a lot of compute. So we're trying to uh, orchestrate a mechanism built for embedded devices and embedded processors to facilitate the security exchange. Next program that I want to mention to you is something called Nemesis. Nemesis is a neutron message intelligence system in space. This, people think, is sci-fi, but it's not because we're building it, and it's pretty cool. RF communications, they're great, but they are very promiscuous. Everyone knows what everyone is doing. You can, you know, encryption is something, but you don't always have that. Uh, in space vehicles, especially in civil capacities, I don't know why people don't use encryption, uh, but that's not our, our, that's our, it can't be our fallback mechanism. So we need new out-of-band means of communication. And so researchers uh, at the University of Lancaster uh, pioneered an approach to be able to send essentially Morse code using subatomic particles, neutrons. And so when I heard about this, I was like, well, that's probably not going to work on Earth so well, but I'm going to put this thing in space. Because neutrons, they can go through things. And you actually, but they can't go through water, and they can't go through other things that you find on Earth. But in space, there's none of this stuff. So how do you use this neutron technology to be able to communicate in an out-of-band fashion, to do key distribution? Because if we can intercept optical signals, laser-based communication, as well as RF communication, um, we have a problem in the future. So we need to develop new out-of-band communication mechanisms to do this. Uh, the technology that we're engaging for this is actually commercial off the shelf, right? This is not new stuff that we're building out of nowhere. Thermo Fisher, which is a big uh, developer of especially medical devices, um, develops neutron generation systems that are this big, and you'd be able to figure out how to put this on a spacecraft, which is kind of our big problem ahead of us. So we're working with one of the intelligence agencies currently to work towards building this out. Uh, next project I want to tell you about is future capability uh, is uh, something called Sherlock MD. This is going back to those th the thinki that thinking of ISAM, OSAM, and they just keep changing the name on me, but uh, in space servicing assembly and manufacturing. So when we do servicing in space, how do you know it's broken? Well, someone has to tell you it's broken, but do you always trust them? So you, no, you shouldn't always trust them. So you should be able to ascertain that yourself, do a third party diagnostic of the system. So currently we're working with Space Force and NASA to develop the system that does third party diagnostics of other people's space vehicles, all on the edge. Also, when you're actually servicing something, how do you actually know that you're servicing it properly? This is possibly a multi-billion dollar asset that you are engaging with. So you just hope that whatever is plugging into it is not going to screw it up or whatever is supposed to like, you know, screw a screw in is not stripping the screw. This is not a good idea. So we need optical-based AI systems, uh, computer vision systems, to be able to facilitate that insight. And so that's what we're designing right now for both Space Force and NASA, to be able to demonstrate that you can do in situ diagnostics of in spacecraft assembly manufacturing. Now, from a cybersecurity standpoint, this has a lot of implications from an offensive standpoint. And the reason why is because if you are able to diagnose, diagnose what a third party is doing to a other space vehicle in a very civil sense, and commercial sense, you probably also figure out what someone else's mission looks like. You can also probably understand what their diagnostic capabilities are or, or what's going on in that vehicle from a, it's an intelligence standpoint, so the SIGINT standpoint. And this is very concerning for... Uh, commercial operators who might want to engage our technology in the future because they'll know that if people have our tech on board, others would be able to possibly determine what they're doing on, the space system, on their space system, which is not something they want. 
So it has these implications for future space, pol future space cyber policy to understand you know, maybe we're building something for one purpose, which is to help improve the security and the, the safety of manufacturing systems and assembly systems in space. However, we also have this question of how do we actually do this from a safe cyber standpoint, and how do we do it from a responsible and ethically playable uh, domain? One more project I'll tell it to you about really quickly because I think I'm out of time. Um, three minutes, okay. So uh, last one is called the Reaper. This is one of my favorites. Uh, the Reaper is intended to think about how do you do uh, space debris remediation? Now, this is really hard because the way we do it today is we try and like grab stuff and then throw it into Earth, and that's probably not very sustainable. Uh, if you think about it at scale, given we have like millions of pieces of little pieces of crap up there, uh, we don't really want to um, consistently think about doing this. So how do we do this at scale? So we have a crazy idea. Crazy idea is we are going to take a whole bunch of space vehicles, put big ass lasers on them, and use these lasers to remediate the debris in place. And the way that works is you can use, demonstrated by both JAXA and NASA at this point, to be able to use lasers to nudge debris. So at incidents of a dispersion event, you could possibly reduce the acceleration capacity of the debris and be able to mitigate what that orbital potential looks like and manage the plane that it ends up orbiting around. Now, why does this have any cyber implications at all? Well, this is actually a multi-agent system requiring at least 26 space vehicles. So again, future capabilities that we have funding to build, but you know, it's going to take 10, 15 years to get there. Um, so this is all interesting and problematic at the same time because the system that we've, we've, we're developing has no communication requirements. This is a fully autonomous agent. And it uses something called reinforcement learning by, by spatial attention meaning that the, each agent has a different region that it is able to operate in, and that region that it's operating in is designated to that asset, but not exclusive to that asset, meaning there could be conflict between these space vehicles. So if you have a whole bunch of big space ships firing big-ass lasers at each other, it's probably pretty problematic. And given they're not coordinating anything, we have possible issues especially if there's something that goes wrong with some of the sensors that are part of the space vehicle. So why am I telling you about this? It's because we need to develop the right policy and standards and requirements in order to uh, make sure that we don't have a nightmare on our hands in 15 years when all this technology is fully vetted and it reaches TRL-9 and we actually send it into space. And so the way I think that we should manage this is by working towards ci space cybersecurity standards. And so as of tomorrow, we're launching the International Standard on Space System Cybersecurity with IEEE Standards Association. Um, I invite everyone who's interested in attending and, and joining our, our standards working group. Um, but we have approval to build out this standard on five different components of space systems, including the space vehicle, ground segment, link segment, user segment, as well as what we call the integration layer. And what we need is international support, not a US show, not a German show, not an Australian show. We need international coalition to develop this in a pseudo-impartial way. And I say pseudo-impartial because everyone's going to bring their own motives. We are, we're not ignorant, and we know that's going to be the case. However, we need to figure out how to arrange a secure by design space system architecture that we can aspire to, that governments can point to and say, this is what I need in my space vehicle in the future. And that way, we can work towards mitigating all of the threats that all the random technology that we're building can uh, make sure that that's not a disaster in the future. Thank you so much for my time. Thank you. Wow, Greg, uh, nobody can accuse you ever of talking down to your audience. This stuff is mind-blowing and really, really interesting. Um, and just before, Lara, before I um, introduce Tara, um, just an invitation. I, uh, hoping that we're all sort of on the same uh, virtual page in terms of um, how much the frequency spectrum is involved pretty much in, all, in nearly everything that you were talking about. So uh, there is a discussion about whether all of radio frequencies are uh, engaging cybersecurity issues. Happy to have that discussion uh, in the halls if you'd like. But really, to start to turn around in our minds what sort of terrestrial-based cybersecurity um, uh, uh, 
uh, protocols, steps, uh, defensive postures will be relevant or need to be adjusted to outer space? That's the really big question. So to help us further answer that, uh, we have Tara Brown. Squadron Leader Brown is currently a military professor at the Stockton Center for International Law at the US Naval War College, where she co-teaches a course on air, space, and cyber law. Squadron Leader Brown is also working on her PhD, which is analyzing whether current legal frameworks are robust enough to respond to threats in outer space, so there we go, that fall below the level of an armed attack. Squadron Leader Brown is also taught at the US Defense Institute of International Legal Studies and was involved in the state consultation process for the Womera Manual on International Law for Military Activities and Operations in Outer Space. That's a mouthful. She has published research on whether the activities of commercial actors in outer space can draw states into armed conflict. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dev. <laughs> It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you so much uh, to Commander Giovanelli for the invitation. Um, and just obviously the normal caveat that any views I express are my own personal views and not necessarily reflective of an official UK position. So I'm going to um, discuss with you the legality of targeting privately owned space infrastructure during armed conflict. And then also um, on the other side of the coin, as um, uh, we've seen in Ukraine with uh, Ukrainian use of Starlink. Um, that's a US company, so does that have any implications for the US? And has it highlighted um, any special considerations uh, that we ought to be aware of going forward when um, commercial entities are being used by a belligerent that's engaged in armed conflict? Um, so, there's a lot to unpack um, throughout the session, and um, one of the key things to have in the back of our mind um, is the enormous reliance uh, that we as a society and also um, that our militaries place on space systems. In 2021, um, the UK launched its integrated operating concept. Um, NATO presented a similar vision um, during a committee meeting in July of last year. Uh, the US has recently reinvigorated uh, what's now known as its uh, CJAD C2 strategy. And however you label it, um, it's this concept that looks at um, how we respond to uh, rivals that are seeking to elicit, um, uh, to basically win without um, eliciting a warfighting response. Um, but that concept of multi-domain integration is also uh, key during armed conflict. It emphasizes um, the importance of uh, integration with our allies, uh, use of all of our levers of power, and um, integration across all five domains. And one of the things that was noted in the UK um, operating concept is uh, we're only as strong and we're only as powerful as our weakest domain. And with space, we've got a host of uh, counter space capabilities, ranging from the kinetic, so your uh, anti-satellite missiles, your directed energy weapons, and then also down to um, radio frequency interference and cyber attacks. And the second thing uh, to have in the back of our minds uh, during this session um, is that whilst um, the military is well accustomed to sometimes being in a targeting situation uh, where a military objective is a dual-use object, um, there has been such growth of the commercial space industry and of systems uh, being used by both industry and the military uh, that in many cases, targeting in the space domain is going to have wider civilian impact. And when operating in space, uh, the military are not always using um, exclusive military systems. So figures um, published last year by astronomer Jonathan McDowell reveal that of 186 orbital launch attempts, um, 21 were carried out by commercial entities that were under contract to their host governments. 83 were carried out by commercial entities um, that were, had contracts with commercial customers, including foreign governments. 
Um, in the UK, we've got our space division of Airbus um, that operates our military satcoms in geostationary orbits. Um, we're investing in startup space companies. Our allies are recognizing the importance of um, commercial space capability. So as an example, the US uh, Air Force and its Army and its National Reconnaissance Office all have contracts with Starlink and with other commercial entities. Um, our adversaries and our competitors um, are doing the same. So Russia's got commercial contracts in place in respect of electronic warfare, for an example. Um, and we've seen the Ukrainian military utilize Starlink during the war. So Starlink's a constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit, and because the time taken uh, for signals to transit back to Earth is much quicker than traditional communication satellites that are in a higher orbit, it's able to provide a much faster um, communications and internet service, and that's been utilized by the Ukrainian uh, military in respect of battlefield communications, um, in respect of facilitating their command and control, um, and then also in support of um, technologies such as drone units. And other commercial uses of satellites that we've seen in the war um, include commercial satellite images to effectively provide real-time tracking of enemy forces' movements, and then also to support allegations of war crimes. So the, I, uh, the ICC have, have used commercial imagery for this purpose. Um, so to give an example, uh, Russia alleged uh, that Ukraine had staged the death of uh, civilians. Um, the imagery that we see up on the slide here from Maxar Technologies was able to counter this. So Russian forces withdrew from uh, Bucha at the end of March 2022. 20, uh, um, Ukraine um, uh, basically was able to use this uh, technology to show that those bodies that you see on the slides uh, were... Um, that that was time-stamped with when Russia was still um, in occupation. So that's an image from the 19th of March when they were still in occupation. Um, other companies that offer high-quality Earth observation imagery um, and synthetic aperture radar imagery include Planet, um, Airbus, ISI, and Capella Space. And to give an example of a scale um, of reliance uh, by four national security or four um, military operations, the US um, National Reconnaissance Office spending on commercial imagery uh, in 2021 was upwards of $300 million uh, that, that year. So to go back uh, to the question of the legality of targeting commercial space infrastructure, um, it's something that's really garnered attention uh, recently with the uh, Ukrainian use of Starlink, but it's, it's an analysis that's going to bear on future conflicts. And um, commercial satellites, I'm going to say at the outset, are capable of amounting to military objectives. And I'm going to share some examples of what states have said regarding the legality of targeting them. So a Russian foreign ministry official said um, commercial satellites may become a target for retaliation and that quasi-civil infrastructure may be a legitimate target. China accused the US of militarizing Starlink. And a former uh, US defense secretary said, we anticipate that adversary nations are unlikely to discriminate between US military satellites and between commercial satellites that are being used for military purposes um, in the event of a conflict. So the cardinal rule of targeting is that you only direct your attacks at military objectives. And a satellite might have dual military and civilian uses. Um, but this won't um, bear on the issue of distinction, it, but it may well bear on other law of armed conflicts um, considerations. So in the case of a, a dual-use satellite, if you target it kinetically, you're looking at destroying the whole satellite. Um, but even where you target it through non-lethal means, it might not be possible to sever um, the satellite into civilian and military components. So perhaps it will if you're looking at targeting, say, a set frequency that the military exclusively use. But more often than not, it's not going to be possible to sever the satellite. So you're going to be looking at loss of satellite services for civilian use. 
Um, criteria to determine a military objective is, uh, does this object by its nature, location, purpose or use offer an effective contribution to the military action of the enemy? And then if yes, um, is its uh, destruction or its neutralization in the circumstances going to offer a definite military advantage to us? So using Starlink um, as an example, because it's a constellation of around 3,400 satellites in low Earth orbit, um, if you target a single satellite um, or a small number, you're not going to cause anything more than a neg negligible disruption because of its inherent redundancy. So then you're not going to have your military advantage, um, and then you've not got your military objective. So uh, to get to your military objective, you'd be looking for a target that's not affected by the redundancy. So either ground infrastructure or a sufficient number of satellites within the constellation. Uh, for other commercial entities operating off a single platform, getting to military advantage might be uh, more straightforward. And once you've confirmed um, military objective, then there's other pertinent international humanitarian law considerations that are going to bear on the question of the, legal of the legality of targeting it. And just to, um, I'm going to mention two of those. So first is the prohibition against indiscriminate attacks, uh, where the effects can be not cannot be limited. So China's 2007 ASAT um, against its own non-functional satellite led to 3,536 large pieces of debris, of which 2,786 remain in orbit. Russia's 2021 targeting of its own satellite uh, led to 1,790 pieces of debris, of which 300 remain in orbit. So it's easy to see that if you're looking at targeting it kinetically, how you're going to fall foul of that prohibition. Um, so cons but consideration um, of indiscriminate attacks can also arise when targeting non-kinetically. Um, so if you render the satellite uh, uncontrollable, then it becomes a conjunction risk to other satellites um, in the orbit. And this might bear on um, matters such as the timing of your attack, um, or you might decide to actually take control of a satellite rather than rendering it uncontrollable. And the second duty that I want to highlight is the duty on commanders uh, to ensure that the incidental loss of civilian life, damage to civilian objects, um, or injury to civilians is not excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage that you anticipate. And the ICRC says that even where a target is a military objective, um, you also still have to consider uh, the impact on civilian functions when you're, dis when you're considering the question of proportionality. So not in terms of inconvenience, but in terms of uh, consequences that are going to meet the standard in Article 515B of Additional Protocol 1. So you're looking for death, injury, or destruction. Um, and cyber attacks that infiltrate a system and result in the loss or manipulation of data or the loss of control of a satellite or the loss of function of a satellite uh, may convert into those effects. But even if you foresee such consequences, a commander might still conclude um, that the attack is not excessive in relation to that advantage that you anticipate. So to conclude, targeting privately owned space infrastructure may be lawful where it's being used for military purposes um, if the ex execution of the attack is in accordance with the law of armed conflict. Um, Starlink hasn't yet been successfully targeted, so Russia um, attempted jamming, but SpaceX was able to provide updates uh, so that um, the software on Starlink bypassed those transmitters. But other commercial entities that our uh, military rely on may, not, may be more vulnerable. Um, and then in terms of cyber, particularly um, space physics pose unique um, challenges to traditional cyber security measures. Um, we've only really seen a cyber attack at the start of a conflict when the Viasat KASAT network uh, was disabled. But cyber attacks are a threat to commercial systems, um, either through targeting the onboard computer itself um, or through infiltration of the ground systems. Um, I want to briefly just mention uh, some examples of cyber attacks in space. So in 19. Um, two minutes. 
Yeah, okay. Um, so in, just to quickly uh, finish off, I believe I've got two minutes left. So in 1998, um, a US and German satellite uh, was taken control of after hackers infiltrated the ground system, and then they turned the satellite into the sun, uh, ren destroying, its, uh, destroying its sensors. Um, in 2007, uh, the Tamil Tigers terrorist group hacked a ground station and took control of uh, Intelsat, which is a commercial satellite, and they used that to um, broadcast uh, TV and radio propaganda. Um, in 2014, after the Russian annexation of Crimea, uh, the, all the Russian uh, navigation satellites uh, were subject to a cyber attack, uh, with corrupted data being uploaded to the system. Uh, during a 2020 Black Hat conference, um, an Oxford researcher, James uh, Parver, demonstrated his methodology in intercepting satellite signals from 18 different commercial satellites. Um, so just to close, we focused on this so far from um, how it's lawful to target a commercial satellite being used by a belligerent. Um, but what I also want to highlight is the awareness that states should have as to the uses um, of commercial satellites where they're the host country for that particular actor, because it may still implica implicate them. Um, so normally, if an internationally wrongful act is committed by a private actor, there's traditional channels under customary international law that you look at to determine whether or not the conduct um, of the private actor can be attributed back to the state. Uh, one of them being instructions, directions and control, which is, um, requires the state to have effective control over the private actor, um, effectively controlling the beginning of the operation, the way it's carried out at, it, at its end, which is a really high standard. Um, Deb mentioned um, in introductory marks uh, the, the compromise that was reached between the US and the Soviet Union, um, and that is that um, states bear responsibility for national activities in space, so including um, those of commercial entities. And so... Um, States need to um, be robust when they're deciding what they're authorizing and what they're supervising um, in space because they need to ensure it's in compliance with the Outer Space Treaty and international law, including neutrality law. Um, and they should be doing this anyway because they don't want to be in a position where their commercial satellites that they rely on um, become a legitimate target. Thank you. Thank you. Tara, thank, thank you so much. Really, really interesting uh, um, pieces of the, uh, both the practical and the legal uh, aspects. And just sort of kick off on your last slide about the, uh, the state responsibility piece. And I'm aware that we're not only lawyers in the audience, so we won't go there. But um, this paradigm of state responsibility for um, uh, acts of its private actors under the laws of war is a uh, it works, works pretty much the same way in outer space as it does a, on, on planet Earth. However, uh, this ties into a few of the other issues that you raised. Think, it, it, it's so much more difficult, uh, given the special characteristics of outer space, to actually ascertain what the, the, the licensing is clear, but what the actual activities are, given the distances and the difficulties in, uh, in time differences, uh, compounding as difficult it is as it is on earth to work out a, a, the, the excuse me the, uh, the the cause chain the causal effects of private actors and nation state actors how much more difficult that is in outer space and that heads to your attribution uh, issues that you've raised so thank you again that's really really helpful uh, our next speaker is johnny ace He's a senior chief petty officer in the Norwegian Armed Forces. He holds degrees in aerospace engineering and in electronics and instrumentation. Johnny is currently finishing his PhD, analyzing maritime activities in the Arctic and Antarctica using AIS and Copernicus satellite data. While working at the Institute for Space Research at the University of Calgary, he developed prototype particle detectors. I looked it up, you're gonna to need to explain what they are still. For US and Japanese scientific rockets, uh, the sea satellites in ESA's swarm mission and led a scientific expedition to the Canadian Arctic. Johnny has led the Norwegian delegation to the NATO satellite capability team and participated in the ACT's assessment of the threats and vulnerabilities that NATO satellite communications may encounter through 2040. 
He is currently serving at the Norwegian Defense University College. Donnie, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, for the very kind um, presentation. Uh, I would like to thank the um, uh, thank the uh, committee for uh, inviting me to uh, to make make this uh, presentation about uh, news uh, about uh, new space. Uh, I will kind of look up, up, upon this from the warfighter's uh, perspective. And uh, as a former radio officer, what, what, what does this really look like from my radio room in a naval vessel? As has been mentioned uh, earlier today, Today, we are, we are experiencing a revolution within satellite communications. Up until quite recently, well, and it's, uh, and it's also the backbone of uh, satellite communication today, uh, we are using uh, big communication satellites in a geostationary orbit. These uh, powerful machines, they provide broadband services, uh, broadband services, telephone, um, Television to uh, to a uh, to a large part of the of the Earth. I mean, one satellite can cover approximately one third of the surface of the uh, Earth. It's a very powerful machine, and it will still remain the backbone of satellite communications. But we see that uh, new actors are um, are coming. Um, the uh, uh, Examples of this are Starlink, which has been mentioned uh, earlier today, uh, OneWeb and uh, Keeper, Kuiper. These are privately owned uh, satellites that uh, fly in low Earth orbit. There are many satellites, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands. So it's uh, often referred to as a mega constellations. Another one is the ASBM. It's the Arctic Satellite Broadband Mission. It's a Norwegian uh, constellation of two uh, satellites that are going to be launched into polar orbit, uh, either late now in 2023 or early 2024, that will provide broadband services in the high Arctic. Uh, it is kind of similar to the, um, to the uh, to the um, communication systems that the, uh, the Soviet Union and Russia have been using for half a century with their um, Molnia, Tundra and Meridian satellites that uh, orbit the Earth once in 12 or 24 hours. The big difference here, one of the differences here is that the Norwegian satellites are going to orbit the Earth three times in two days. Uh, they will have three payloads. They are, it's, uh, it's a civilian for Inmarsat that will be compatible with uh, Inmarsat services from geostationary orbit. It's a military expand for the Norwegian Armed Forces. And it's a uh, payload that we're flying for an international partner. Which are doing, yeah, an international partner. Uh, these satellite co uh, constellations have something uh, in common. They are very attractive at high latitudes, very, very easily use uh, loose uh, communications with geostationary orbit or geostationary satellites. For the continental uh, United States, for, for, for continental Europe, this is not really a problem. But as you move into the high Arctic or high Antarctica, uh, we lose uh, communications at um, 81.3 degrees latitude in the uh, in in uh, the Norwegian Arctic that would be just north of uh, the Spitsbergen Islands. One of our challenges is that we have a search and rescue uh, um, responsibility responsibilities that go all the way up to the North Pole, and in my AIS data I see that there is both fisheries and tourism going on in, um, at latitudes where we do not have satellite communications. So these, uh, these new um, 
new satellites, they will be very useful for search and rescue uh, operations. Uh, the same in the alpine areas, where you, where you do not really, uh, where it kind of depends on the local geography, whether you have uh, satellite communications or not. Or not. You can have uh, communications with a geostationary orbit, a satellite in geostationary orbit, if you're in a valley that's located in the north-south direction. You can. If your valley is located in the east, is uh, or oriented in the east-west direction, then you will probably have mountains to the south or to the north of you, which uh, makes communications with the geostationary orbit quite difficult. And uh, then it's a really big advantage with these satellites in low orbit that will literally pa pass overhead of you. So um, that's a big advantage. The third constellation, the last constellation, and here I have apologized to uh, anyone who is uh, speak, uh, speaking fluently Mandarin. My, uh, my Mandarin is uh, really, really bad. I think it's pronounced Gu Wang. It's a constellation that has been uh, mentioned in, uh, in the recent literature, and you can kind of compare it with, uh, it has been approximated as uh, China's uh, Starlink communication system. So, a lot, a lot of interesting things are happening. These uh, services, they are very affordable. My Christmas present for myself uh, last year was a Starlink uh, terminal. It costs about 450 euros, and uh, the monthly fee is about 90 euros. They will have uh, almost unlimited uh, bandwidth, and they have upload, uh, measured upload speeds, that's 130 megabit per, se per second, which is way more than uh, what we have in 4G or 5G systems. It's very easy to use. You only need to put, this, uh, put, the, uh, set, uh, put the terminal out in the field where you have, uh, where there is, uh, where you have, in an open space. You use, your, uh, use the app on your, uh, on your cell phone and the, uh, the terminal finds the satellites. So you have communications within just a few minutes. It's very easy to use and it's way much more affordable than um, standard military communications like with the uh, wideband global uh, satcom system. And in my experience, if something is affordable, lightweight and easy to use, then it's very attractive for the military. But, and, uh, this is, uh, and in my experience, when we, when we get the new equipment, we very rarely ask the, you know, the big difficult question, does it work? Will it work in a contested environment? And uh, it's very easy to imagine that in a future conflict, we will be facing a, an opponent which is very competent, has very well equipped and trained uh, personnel that are good with electronic warfare and cyber warfare. They have the equipment that they need and they have good leadership. Will these new constellations work? I don't know. Uh, there was a list uh, on top of my head, there are four questions that we should ask ourselves. How robust are the communication links? There I mean the, the link between your terminal and the satellite. Uh, can this opponent insert uh, energy or, or signals into this link and uh, jam it? How robust are the satellite communication links? I mean, that's the links between the ground station and the satellite that actually controls the machine, the communication payload. I believe that if you are able to get control of these communication links, you can easily hijack a satellite or a satellite constellation and make it useless. 
Do the terminals require uh, timing and position data? Um, what we see in Norway during uh, exercises is that in the regions uh, close to our Russian border, uh, GPS is uh, jammed. This creates uh, problems both for, for the military, but also for uh, civilian, uh, civilian aviation. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves, are these terminals uh, vulnerable to the GPS jamming? And also, at what distances can uh, an opponent detect transmissions from such a terminal? Are we giving our, away our positions using these, uh, these services? So my big question is, will new space actually work when I need it? So my recommendation to my commanders is that we should test these new services under realistic and um, simulated contested environments. And we should also allow ourselves to come up with the conclusion that no, this not, does not work. This service is not good enough for the, for the military use. Uh, and as a... Uh, and you know, when, when I'm sitting in my radio room, I would rather have a system that I know works than a really big, long, and uh, impressive uh, pace plan that uh, does not really work. Just a few systems that we actually need, that we actually know works, that's what I need in my radio room. So, Okay, what happens when we uh, find that the system does not, is not good enough? And here we come into the legal consequences, where, which the panel knows, probably know the answer better to than I do. Say that we find that, they, um, that, is, uh, that uh, one of these services are not good enough for military use. Could they then be used for kind of first responders for the civilian agency that also need communications when, uh, when um, a conflict is taking place? And would it then be targeted, could it then be targeted uh, by an opponent when it's used by civilian users? And the, and the military have decided that no, it's not good enough for our use. That's something that we'd really like to know the answer of, answer to. Yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what you've really pushed me to think about is, uh, is the sort of parallel situation. The same way that uh, everywhere uh, in our uses of cyberspace, when we have convenient, well-priced, equipment that we buy ourselves for as Christmas gifts or as other gifts or birthday presents for friends, um, we're perhaps purchasing a vulnerability in cybersecurity. So extrapolating from what you've presented in terms of unusual uses of satellites, uh, where do we, um, where should we really focus our thinking and our attention in terms of a robust cybersecurity for unusual uses of satellites and of other equipment in outer space? And I think it's a really important question. It's not being looked at. So thanks for shining a light on that. Our final speaker is uh, Peter Marquez. Uh, Peter, you're still with us? Yeah, great. Super. Uh, I'm here. Thank you very I'm kindly here. for joining us, despite uh, uh, um, the difficulties of distance. Peter is the head, Peter Marquez is the head of global space policy at Amazon Web Services, where he oversees space policy activities for Amazon Web Services. He served at the White House for three previous administrations, uh, a, an achievement unto itself, and was the director for space policy for Presidents Bush and Obama. As senior advisor to the National Space Council, Peter was responsible for the development, implementation, and coordination of US national space policy. He also worked in the commercial space sector in senior management positions at Andart Global and Orbital Sciences Corporation. Peter served for over a decade in the Pentagon where he worked on a variety of space and classified programs for the Air Force and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. 
He's a graduate of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University, a board member of the Chaban Institute for Space and Security, and a member of the Space Camp Hall of Fame. Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you. You may start. I appreciate it. And, uh, Address the uh, the most important thing that I'm sure everybody's asking. Uh, my hair is real. Uh, no, the neck brace. Uh, I will tell you if you're younger, stop playing rugby. Right, um, it will come back to haunt you. Um, so that's uh, that's why I couldn't be there in person. My surgeon told me. so. I really appreciate the conference organizers allow me to participate remotely. This is a, an extremely important discussion. Uh, and uh, I'm really part of this. So thank you, Deborah, and thank you, uh, David, and the rest of the conference orders for letting me participate. Um, if we could go ahead and go to the slides now, and uh, I think I can click these over myself. Um, the, the first thing that I will tell you, um, being married and having children, is that if uh, somebody wants to prove a point, they use your own words against you. So here is show you a report from the Chatham House that essentially just says NATO is incredibly reliant on space systems and let us just assume that those space systems will become will come under cyber attack um, and that will have a significant number of effects uh, not only for uh, military conduct but as it says there for civil infrastructure so um, as the previous speakers all noted Space is at the middle of everything. It is commerce, transportation, energy, weather, communications, national security, everything else um, that makes things go. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about is let's just for a second put aside the legality of whether or not one should attack a space system or whether or not it's a viable target. I'm going to come from the perspective of let us assume that it is going to be attacked. Space is a little interesting uh, in its vulnerabilities. Um, I am now at Amazon Web Services. I am a space person by training, slowly learning to be a cyber person. Well, all of you is that if you're a space person, you need to become a cyber person as well. And if you're a cyber person, you need to become a space person. One of the things that I have learned um, as you know, becoming somebody who handles data and works in this environment uh, for cloud computing, is there are a lot of lessons learned from the cyber community that we will need to take over to the space community. The um, if you look at uh, like cloud infrastructure or things that AWS runs, we are concerned about human systems. We are concerned about supply chain. We are of course concerned about uh, our our cloud data centers, which, you know, here on the space corollary would be our mission ground systems. And then the on-orbit spacecraft, you know, we can kind of look at that at data as transfer uh, in the cloud community. There are a lot of lessons learned that, that those of you from the cyber community can help bring to the space community to help us uh, up our systems and have better protection. Um, I, it is a very complex problem that I'll get into a little bit later, but we have here on the left-hand side, essentially a lot of hardware vulnerabilities. On the right-hand side, though, is another set of vulnerabilities that we need to be concerned about. So we have the actual hardware and spacecraft issues and, and the whole supply chain that goes into that. But space systems are a little bit different than, say, um, materiel. They, they function and provide data and services and analytics. And so we also have to be concerned of data and all the things that go into using a spacecraft, those present their own set of vulnerabilities. So for example, if you look at the typical TCPED cycle that I put up here on the right-hand side of the screen, um, the we've had customers come to us and say, if we task a satellite, will that tasking, the actual transmission of that tasking be secure? We do not want adversaries to know what we have tasked for, I think, very obvious reasons for those of you in the room. And then you get to the collection standpoint. Um, you have things like, um, you know, uh, deep fakes, uh, a lot of falsified information that is coming in. Is the image that I collected or the data that I transferred accurate? Is it what it should be? Then when you get into the processing, is, are the analytics, the code that I'm using to process images or process uh, electronic collection, 
is that analytics tool, can I trust it? Is there something in the software that I can trust? Um, and that gets into the analytic part, what is next? And then also, finally, that data has to get to somebody to be useful. Um, and you have to store the data as well. In transit has to be secure, data at rest has to be secure. So all these things together, both the left and the right, the hardware parts that I think we all know about and the right-hand side for space makes this a very complex problem. Um, in my government career, I just always assumed space systems would be attacked. In my you know, uh, uh, industry career, um, working at a uh, data service provider, um, at a, a, a cloud provider, we just assume we will be under attack as well. And so we build for that. So one of the things that I want to also discuss here is maybe some principles, some things for us to think about uh, as we go through and look at uh, cybersecurity principles for space. Um, the first one there in the purple, just operate with a risk-based uh, engineering uh, standpoint. Just assume you're going to be under attack. Uh, develop and implement plans for your space systems. Have encryption, other ways to check that your data in transit is secure. Um, a lot of these are very familiar to all of you that work in the cyber domain. What we are finding, interestingly enough, in the space domain is that companies are not thinking about this. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, we have run uh, space accelerator programs for startup companies, uh, startup companies in the space uh, market. When we talk to them about cybersecurity, a lot of the comments we get back are, we're a small company, it's not really a priority for us, who's going to be looking for our capabilities, who's going to be looking for our intellectual property. We've had to show them the data that there is a lot of intellectual property theft. And also, if you don't start baking in cybersecurity to your source code from the beginning or looking at your supply chains from the beginning, those problems will just compound. So there's an awareness problem, um, you know, as, as Deborah mentioned, talking about news. There are a lot of new companies that are coming with amazing capability that don't think that there is a problem. And we're working very hard to let them know that not only is there a problem, you need to plan for there to be problems uh, in the future. So um, as, as we've told them, if you look into the future, the least important space will ever be is today. That, that's it. Um, tomorrow, it will always be used for something more. It'll only get more and more complex and more and more necessary. So build in the capabilities now. So um, one of the things that we do is, you know, I've, I've kind of walked through where the vulnerabilities are and some of the concepts that we need to look at for how we start bringing cybersecurity into the space domain. This is not going to be an easy process. I'll just say that out front. Um, if you look at just on the cloud side, I'll use the cloud example again. Part of what we do at AWS, uh, we have a uh, a number of security capabilities. We essentially call it our top priority. We make sure that the cloud is secure for anybody to use. And that means that we have over 300 different tools that we use for uh, security. We uh, uh, meet 143, that's 100, yeah, 143 different security standards that exist around the world. Um, and there's a, like, I think 117 different AWS services um, that uh, offer encryption of data for our customers. So there's a breadth of capability. There's a breadth of standards. There's a lot of different um, capabilities out there and a lot of different needs that we're going to have to work through as a community to help um, uh, space companies as well as government space users and, and government space operators. So, you know, I think at the beginning, uh, Greg mentioned the, the standards and working through those. I think that's a very important thing that we all talk about standards for uh, cybersecurity frameworks. We talk about um, physical security um, for ground stations. We talk about physical security for supply chain. Um, we talk about um, uh, just very simple cyber hygiene things that I have, I won't name names, but in certain space companies, I've, I've been shocked as to what I have seen or for um, probably to say it better, what I have not seen. 
Um, and I think another thing we really need to work on, and I think everybody here knows this part, is that the biggest threat, and if you go back to the slide I had before, the biggest threat is on the um, in, uh, staff and making staff aware, your human systems, uh, still is the biggest vulnerability that we see uh, and making sure that your human component is securing your system and also is aware of the threats. So I think those are the most important things that we look at. Uh, just a few final things I want to mention is that um, in, in the U.S., we had put together a Space Policy Directive 5. It's a specific directive about cybersecurity for space. And it's an interesting thing that during the process of developing that policy, we interviewed a number of space companies. Um, and they, when we interviewed them, we asked about their views on cybersecurity. And they, many of them mentioned that they viewed cybersecurity as an extra expense uh, and not a primary concern. Um, and, and if you, again, look at some of the new space companies as well, they came back and said, well, we are investing in our technology first, and then we'll look at cybersecurity later. So when the Space Policy Directive 5 in the U.S. was written, it was written in a way that we took a philosophy that you're going to pay me now or you're going to pay me later. You cannot defer cybersecurity and space capabilities. You're going to pay for it one way or another. And I'm of the opinion that preventive medicine costs a whole lot less. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm currently physical proof of <laughs> preventive medicine is probably much better than continuing to bash your head in playing sports. Um, so we take a pay me now or pay me later approach to cybersecurity in space. It's just, it's not even a question of if you should do it or, or how you do it. It's just, you have to do it. So um, let me just finish here with a couple of resources for you to take a look at for um, additional, um, uh, trying to get the slide to transfer here. Here we go. And uh, just some, a few things for you to look at. If you haven't seen the Chatham House report on cybersecurity and NATO's uh, space-based strategic assets, I highly recommend you do. Really great uh, document. Uh, the White House reports you see there, um, the CISA reports. And then another very interesting one I recommend you take a look at is this MITRE attack framework. Um, MITRE has an open uh, repository of different attacks um, that have happened on space systems from a cyber perspective. Uh, and uh, it's a really interesting website to walk through it and see actual evidence of cyber attacks and mitigation techniques and, and the rest. So uh, with that, I think I'm out of time. And uh, really, really, again, thank you very much for having me and I appreciate it. Peter, thank you so much. Uh, wise words, and uh, especially uh, a takeaway uh, for me to uh, sort of uh, really emphasize is the risk-based approach. It makes a lot of sense, and as much as new space really ignites our imaginations and it takes us to places where we haven't yet been in our minds, uh, even more so, it ignites the, uh, the imaginations and the planning of adversaries. And therefore, the risk-based approach is certainly certainly the way to go. So that was really helpful. Thank you. And also for the resources that you've offered. Uh, and a big thank you, round of applause to all of our uh, participants who've each contributed a lot of wisdom. So Greg, Tara, Johnny, and Peter, thank you very, very much. Uh, we, we have more. Uh, so now it's your turn. Uh, it's time for audience questions, comments, and I think we'll take uh, three at a time, and uh, you panelists can choose uh, how you want to start. Let's just do it in the same order. So Greg, you'll start, and then Tara, and then you two. So question number one, sure. Just say your name, where you're from, and your, what your question is. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, Veronique Vollmer, based in London, working for BAE Systems, doing cyber threat intelligence. Um, Craig, question for you. Obviously, awesome the things, the projects that you presented, absolutely mind-blowing. Now, my question is, especially for stuff like Nemesis, you said neutrons don't work on the, well, on Earth that well, in a sense, like for the project you're doing, or also for Reaper. Um, so how, how do you develop those capabilities? What kind of tools are you using? Because obviously you can't test it just as it is right now. Uh, is it all, you know, in your hats? Is it all virtual? Like, how, how are you doing it? So, so we start, that's a good I, question. Excuse me, sorry, we, we, let's just take three and then you can take the first oh, one. Sorry. That'll be directed. <laughs> Next person. 
gonna have to remember that. So, uh, uh, Major Brian Ladd with the U.S. Space Force. Uh, one of the questions I have is about quantum computing and in specifics to encryption. Uh, and what is the uh, the cyber community doing to uh, mitigate this particular threat uh, for both current and all for future uh, concerns? Hello, Media Yari from France, working for Airbus. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentations that you made. Uh, I have a question. I would like to know. Uh, what kind of uh, new threats that can bring the new space compared to the current space? Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Uh, Kubo, go ahead. Am I allowed? Uh, still the <laughs> fourth question. Four, fourth question. The fourth out of the three questions. Exactly. <laughs> uh, my name is Kubo Machak. Uh, I work as a legal advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, so I was actually inspired for my question by Tara's presentation, but uh, perhaps other panelists will also have a view. So I, I very much agree you know, with you highlighting the applicable rules of international law when it comes to targeting of uh, commercial satellites that are being used for military purposes. Uh, and of course, uh, one has to comply with all the applicable rules. So I would also add the rules on precautions in attack. So even if we get through the analysis that you presented, yeah. there is still the precaution stage so if a belligerent was able to conduct the operation without any effect or by minimizing the impact on the civilian infrastructure, the, there would still be an obligation to do that. But my question, so thinking about that, I started thinking, what about precautions? So the other kind of precautions, passive precautions. Yeah. And I think this is relevant for everybody in the room because states are obliged to take passive precautions already in peacetime. So these are measures that states have to take in order to minimize the impact on the civilian population from any danger that arise from military operations once an armed conflict breaks out. So just to throw the question to the panel, what are such measures that you have uh, you know, identified in your research, in your work, that you think states should already be taking now? And so the ICRC has proposed some. So we are thinking about, for example, segregating the military uses of space objects from civilian uses, or if there is a space object that is exclusively dedicated for you know, peaceful uses, then states should register it as such. But perhaps there are other measures that we should be aware of, and I would really like to hear from our panelists' thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you, Cool, and the rest of our questions. So, uh, Greg, indeed, you start us off, and uh, the, the other three can sort of think about responses to the other three, the other three questions. Okay. Please. Certainly. So, if I can, uh, if I can try and recap the question, it is based off of a lot of the technology that we're trying to develop in the future. Uh, how do we, how do we test it? Given it's it's pretty far out and it's kind of hard to hard to test. Um, so. First step to doing so is obviously a very rigorous simulation and emulation tools. Uh, this is um, pretty standard in most computer science realms to work on when it comes to testing. Getting a little bit more comfortable in the aerospace community using digital twins and uh, model-based system engineering. Uh, model-based system engineering has been around for quite a long time in aerospace. However, we're increasingly using more extensive models and, and a lot of computing mechanisms to engage with this. Um, it is challenging to get access to realistic simulations. So we actually have to buy these from companies, and that's actually a very big pain point of academia and government because these simulation environments are essentially for us to be able to test our stuff so that we know it will work on your actual system when we pay millions of dollars for it. But you then char but you charge a lot of money for the actual the simulation as well. So that's kind of hard for us to engage with. However, that's how we're starting out with this. We have pur purchased a whole bunch of flat sat environments um, and uh, simulation environments to start testing. But we have also begun investments for actual testing chambers uh, to be able to actually test some of these things in real life as well. So for example, uh, Cornell University gave me a bunker nuclear bunker to be able to test my neutron communication technology in, uh, which is under radiation safety review right now because I don't know how to operate ionizing radiation material. Uh, but anyway, there, there is opportunities. There are opportunities to test things in real life as well. And, and there are, there are in, in the coming years, we expect to be able to escalate this towards flight experiments that are often sponsored by NASA and the Space Force as well. But thanks for the question. So our second question was on quantum uh, quantum computing and encryption. Uh, that's sort of the beginning of it. Does anybody want to take a bite out of that? Anyone brave enough? I think... Uh, <laughs> Deborah, I think I... Sure, I, go for it. 
think I can get part of it. And it's, a, it's almost a non-answer, unfortunately. So what I would recommend uh, to my Space Force colleague there is to contact me. There are some things that we're doing that uh, are a little proprietary regarding protection uh, uh, from a cyber standpoint and quantum encryption. Um, so uh, if you could find a way to get to me, um, I would be more than happy to talk to you about what it is that, that we're doing and what we're seeing. Okay, Peter, I think you can expect many people being in touch, so they, they know where to find you. So uh, expe expect a lot of... And I can't uh, run away right now. Right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, our third question was on new threats, and um, um, if you would like to drill down on that, that would be great, but did anybody want to take that up specifically? Would you like to rephrase? Do we have somebody uh, here in the third row here? Yeah, would you like to sort of focus in on it? Maybe we can get... Uh, more specific. Yes, we are to, we, we, you have presented and you have well explained that we have mitigations uh, about the new space, uh, uh, the new challenges that we have with the new, new space with OneWeb, with Starlink. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to know is, okay, uh, compared to the current threats that we have, the landscape in terms of threats that we have for the current space, what this kind of new technologies, new space can bring in terms of uh, new threats? What kind of new threats may, we, we may have? I'm happy to, yeah. So not necessarily answering the whole question, sorry, so maybe some of my other panelists will come in, but um, I think in terms of the way that the military can respond to um, particularly um, commercial use and the threats that uh, you're seeing with regards to commercial satellites that they're relying on, um, there's... Um, war gaming that can be done between like the military and the commercial sector and um, commercial integration cells there's perhaps um i think i mentioned in my presentation there's more vulnerabilities because of space physics so it's harder to apply your normal sort of cyber security standards um and the uk's obviously got its, its cyber toolkit but um even where you've got these um difficulties one thing that it might be important to look at from a military perspective could be to um, look at, say, um, any subcontractors within the loop and also what security standard are they being held to? Because we have, when we're using our own organic um, assets, uh, there's, there's so much regulation and so much um, uh, in terms of... Uh, what standards have to be met, and perhaps there's not um, always always that same standard um, when we're operating with the commercial sector. So uh, that's something that could be looked at. Uh, I would love it, uh, just to give you a break and sort of prepare mentally for answering Kubo's question. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, add something else that may help with that the question that you've just asked, and it's about something that we do pretty well on Earth and much less well in outer space in terms of our cybersecurity um, pre uh, prevent uh, protection mechanisms, and that's information sharing. So uh, we're not completely there uh, on Earth, but we have a lot of mechanisms. We have the sea certs and the certs that are connected by either by treaty or, a, or by the more practical level, and they probably work better when the lawyers aren't involved. Yeah. Um, um, and real sort of community of practitioners that has a global reach in terms of information sharing pretty much instantaneously on Earth, with a lot of caveats, right? That exists much uh, to a much lesser degree in outer space, and as uh, most of us in the cybersecurity community know, information sharing is key in, in sort of mitigating to the extent we can uh, information asymmetry between attackers and, uh, and defenders. So I think that's another thing that we could sort of put into the pile to really work hard on information sharing between diverse actors in outer space that could really help. So do you want to take on the yeah, final question? Absolutely. Um, and I'd also just add to that, Deb, that um, with regards to information sharing, um, one of the difficulties that we sometimes have in the military is classification, and we don't always necessarily face that same barrier um, when operating with commercial actors. Um, but yet, yeah, just to come to your question, Kubo, uh, with regards to passive precautions, um, I think, obviously, if you can segregate um, uh, the space um, capability into military and civilian components, um, then that's brilliant. Um, I think passive precautions are perhaps easier when you're looking at um, 
Like if you were to take out a single satellite um, with an ASAT, you could perhaps angle the impact of attack so that the debris re-enters the atmosphere and doesn't stay within orbit. Um, but in terms of exclusive uh, military systems, this was something that was actually um, suggested by one of the editors of the Womb Manual that's coming out later this year. And um, he deemed it, um, he said it was a, like an affirmative duty of re what he called reverse distinction. And I think the difficulty um, is that is, if the military can use an exclusively military system, then that's, that's the ideal situation. Um, but the difficulty is like some of this technology and some of these capabilities we only need at a particular time. So you might have an imagery satellite that's up there already doing things such as um, looking at melting of ice caps and looking at soil erosion and carbon levels in forests. And we might need to tap into that capability for, in support of a particular military operation and a time limit um, for a certain amount of time. And some states don't have their organic space assets anyway, so they're not going to be in a position to do that. Um, and even the ones that do, it would be so uh, cost pro probative to be able to do that. Um, and it would also add to congestion. So I think you have got the duty of passive precautions, but it's not always going to be feasible, um, would be my answer. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for a... Um one or two more, any more uh, audience Rob, questions? Thanks. Oh, yes, please do. Um, if I may add something yeah. to the fourth uh, question. I mean, sitting in my radio room, I just need one or two systems at work. And uh, if system three and four and five uh, works, I do not really need them. So please, uh, please go ahead and use them. Uh, so the idea of having some systems that are used exclusively by the military and uh, or exclusively by civilians, I think that's a, that's a very good idea. Uh, one of the, uh, see, seen from a Norwegian perspective, one of the um, consequences here that could complicate things are, uh, are training and uh, purchase of uh, equipment. So uh, within, uh, in uh, Norway, um, and then uh, the, uh, the cyber, cyber defense forces are the lead agency for, for training. So we kind of reach out to police, border forces, uh, so they can do training with us. Uh, that could kind of complicate, uh, complicate things, but um, I mean, a policeman can, uh, can uh, hold the same uh, lectures that I do. So, uh, so it's not impossible to overcome. So, so it's a good idea. Greg, would you Sorry. like to add anything to that question, or we can? No, that's so, out of my expertise. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> One any, uh, final question from anybody? Yes, ma'am. Peter, you mentioned that when it comes to especially smaller space companies that they're not very focused on cybersecurity as they're doing initial build. For those companies that you found that do have some uh, focus on cybersecurity, is it because they have that experienced cybersecurity professionals or have they kind of engineered their way from first principles and kind of reinvented the wheel with and arrived at cybersecurity? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, it's it's um, unfortunately there isn't a specific character type uh, when it comes to a space company as to whether or not they are uh, going to be more likely to embrace cybersecurity standards or not. I will tell you that um, companies, at least what I have found, is that companies that are focused on data and analytics uh, as part of their service and are not focused on hardware. Um, tend to ascribe to more cybersecurity. They're more willing to embrace it very early on. Um, and, and let me be clear, I'm not saying that there are companies that are against it or not willing to embrace it. The companies that we find that are not taking cybersecurity on from day zero just aren't thinking about it. Um, so I think it's the ones that are more data-focused, analytics-focused. The ones that we find that are um, 
less concerned about it, or at least not thinking about it, are more focused on building a widget um, and building specific hardware. And so they feel that, hey, we're just building hardware. Who's going to, you know, we're, we're a six-person startup company based, you know, in New York. Um, who's going to come looking for us? And they don't think about it from early on because they're very much focused on the tech. Um, that would probably be the, the, maybe the demarcation I see is between those that have a data focus versus those that have a hardware focus. Um, but as I've explained, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, the vulnerabilities are there uh, regardless and uh, that we're trying our best to, to spend a lot of time with, with those companies. And I know at least from uh, the U.S. government perspective, there's been a concerted effort to bring that in. Um, the Office of the National Cyber Directorate has had a series of meetings across the United States, including having a summit at the White House with uh, aerospace CEOs to talk about the importance of cyberspace all up and down the supply chain. So um, it, it seems to be a, a uh, um, an opportunity to excel, is what I will say. Thank you, Peter. With that, we'll conclude. Thank you all for your participation. And once again, to our panelists. And uh, please, please feel free in your names. I'll offer uh, your accessibility if there are any additional questions or comments that uh, you want to get to them, either virtually or in person. Please do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.